My beauty is so tremendous, it has to be edited out of magazines and movements, whitewashed from history, evacuated from sermons, streets, and schools just to prove that it does not exist. My beauty is so tremendous that they try to confine it, build health and science, fashion and finance as gates around it, but my beauty, you can still peek through and see it. My beauty is so tremendous, there are no words for it, or rather the words, they are too ugly for my beauty. My beauty is so tremendous that they had me believe for so long it was not there. So when I finally found it here, and all the places I was taught to hate here, and my body not theirs, I finally figured it out. My beauty, my beauty is so tremendous that the men, the men will have to kill me for it, but my beauty, my beauty will still be there when I am gone. My, stu my beauty will still be here when I am gone. Hello, my name is Alok, and there are many words that I could use to describe what I do, but I'm currently in a polyamorous relationship with all of them, and we're still very much in the process of figuring out our shit. <laughs> when I speak about the writer in me, the performer, they get jealous. The designer has been ghosting on the model for a while, and they're not really on good speaking terms. Yes, this is my roundabout way of letting you know that I use the gender-neutral pronoun they and them. I do this for several reasons, one of them being that I absolutely adore hearing from complete strangers how you care more about the English grammar than actual humans for whom this courtesy could go a long way in making our lives a little bit less exasperating. Contrary to popular opinion, I am not a man in a dress. Or rather, you're only allowed to call me one if you also refer to me as a lady when in slacks. When people ask me if I'm a boy or a girl, I usually respond, no. But what I can tell you is that my five o'clock shadow is a built-in contour, and my bountiful body hair is a testament to the fact that I am so fabulous that my body found a way to accessorize itself. <laughs> I come, I come from a legacy of people with such tremendous beauty that they were criminalized for it. In colonial India, the British used to detain anyone they read as a man wearing female garments. In New York City, where I currently live, police officers would strip search gender non-conforming people to determine what their actual genders were. These laws were referred to as the three article law, meaning that we had to wear at least three articles of clothing associated with our assigned gender, otherwise risk being thrown in jail. Sometimes the police would just invent laws in order to criminalize us. One time, Sylvia Rivera went out just wearing makeup in public and they still put her in prison. The charge read, female impersonation from the shoulders up. Even though they knew that they would be persecuted for it, my transcestors continued to go outside wearing whatever they wanted. When a law has no basis in justice, it is not being defied, it is merely irrelevant. When they would get out of jail, they would dust off their heels and go right back out. At their heart, cross-dressing laws were about restricting the mobility of gender non-conforming people, ensuring that we were always kept in our place outside of public view. This legacy of keeping us on the margins continues today. We are usually invited to stages like this to entertain you, rarely to educate you. The sad truth is that it's easier for people to regard who I am as a costume, not a human being. What if I told you that cross-dressing laws, they never ended? That 50 years after the Stonewall Rebellion, I still can't walk down the streets of any major global city without fear of being bashed. Every day, I have to make the impossible choice between authenticity and safety. When I step outside, people laugh at me and take photos without my consent. I'm routinely insulted, spat on, and pushed. I constantly fear physical and sexual violence. I can't even post a photo of myself online without having hundreds of people telling me that I'm a grace who deserves to be exterminated. Invisibility is a political project. Disappearance is a calculated strategy. What you don't see says as much as what you do. The fact that I'm often the first person who looks like me that people have encountered speaks to how there's an orchestrated effort of hundreds of years to remove our, our image from the public imagination. They say that there are only two genders, but what they don't show you is the work that they do to erase those of us who defy this cultural myth. They've done such a good job of it that people continually mistake us as new, even though we've always been here. 
So many people tell me that my life would be easier if I just tried harder to pass as a woman or a man, but why should I have to change my appearance to make other people more comfortable? Why? Why is the onus always put on us and not the people who are actually attacking us? I come from people who chose to be visible even when it was hard, precisely because it was hard. Because at a fundamental level, they understood that the reason that they were being persecuted was because they were so powerful. I remember Stephanie Yellowhair, a Native American trans woman, who after being mocked by the police for her clothes and makeup, looked at them straight in the face and said, excuse my beauty. Excuse my beauty. The reason we are so ruthlessly hunted is not because we are wrong, it is because they think that they are right. There's a difference. It is because we are so beautiful. Beauty is about being yourself, a fierce commitment to individuality, even in the face of political and social repression. Our beauty cannot coexist with the lives that they are living because we reveal that it is not we who wear the masks. I repeat, it is not us who wear the masks. They accuse us of masquerading as something we are not, but tell me, what do you call having to repress your creativity, your individuality, your autonomy, and your agency in order to be accepted? Conformity requires us to minimize our differences for the greater good. We fear that if we don't conform, then we'll be abandoned, but there is no loneliness like having people only see you after you've erased yourself. We should be able to look like whatever we want without fearing persecution. We should be able to wear whatever we want without fearing violence. We should be able to decide what clothes mean to us and not the other way around. People tell me that I am brave for being myself. I am not. Frankly, I am terrified and exhausted. But I keep going anyways because I believe that it shouldn't require bravery to do something as simple as being yourself. Believe me, I've done incredibly brave things. One time, I paired yellow boots with a red jumpsuit. <laughs> But being me, that's not bravery, it's honesty. So let's be honest. Let's stop congratulating people for being the first and instead question what made their journey so difficult to begin with. Rather than focusing on our courage, let's redirect the conversation to their complicity. It is easier to expect us to be resilient than it is to remove the obstacles that make it so impossible for us to live. A few years ago, I was offered my first cover of a major magazine. They told all the models to wear an everyday outfit, so naturally, I put on a completely recreational, functional six-inch heel and a pattern dress so bold it would make even your most rambunctious substitute teacher blush, okay? And when I tell you I was posing, I was posing like if the world were to end in that very moment and that all that remained was my cover, my pose would single-handedly have redeemed all of the human race for all of its tragic fashion choices. As we were taking a break, I heard the photographer whisper to the editor, Do you want the best photo, or do you want the politically correct photo? Next thing I knew, I was dismissed early. I did not end up appearing on the cover. People want the aesthetic of diversity, but they don't actually want us. I am not an idea. I am not a symbol. I am not a prop. I am a person. And if you really cared about us, you would listen to what we had to say. Here is what I have to say. From a young age, we have been misled to believe that random and arbitrary articles of cloth, textile, color, scent have a gender. They do not. They become gendered as part of a political project of making the Western gender binary. Because of this, we repress our own creative expression, limit our aesthetic imagination, and confine our potential beauty. Some of us don't wear skirts or lipstick because we've been told that they are feminine and that to be feminine is to not be masculine. Some of us do not wear ties because we've been told that they are masculine and to be masculine is to not be feminine. We rehash contrived and monolithic images of masculinity and femininity, which at this point have become so flat, it's like soda that's been in the fridge for centuries. And that's not fashion, darling, it's a farce. 
Every article of clothing should be for anyone who wants to wear it, regardless of their gender. Casting, marketing, and sales must reflect this value. The time has come for us to completely degender the fashion and beauty industries. I'll say that again. The time has come for us to completely degender fashion and beauty industries. We must do this. Mm -mm. We must do this not to be politically correct, but rather to stop being incorrect. There's a difference. It is incorrect to say that trans people like me are newly in fashion. We have always been part of the story. As hairdressers, makeup artists, stylists, we built contemporary beauty with our blood, sweat, and shoulder pads. And yet, our aesthetics and labor made it into the room, but never our ideas and bodies. We inspire, but we are never hired. We are the mood boards, not the models. We are offered compliments, not contracts. Thank you for the love and light, but I prefer love and good lighting because at least I can take a selfie with that. It is incorrect. It is incorrect for publications to celebrate cisgender heterosexual people as the vanguards of the gender neutral fashion trend and the new masculinity. We have been doing this since the very beginning. We are not a trend. We are not a moment. We are a movement. It is incorrect that gender neutrality has to mean drab, gray, shapeless athletic wear. Gowns can be gender neutral. Makeup and jewelry are gender neutral. Gender neutrality is not the death of fashion, it is the renaissance of fashion. Degendering fashion shouldn't just be granted lip service, we deserve our full embodiment. It looks like amplifying the leadership of trans and non binary creatives, donating proceeds to organizations that fight for trans justice, and taking a firm stand against the rising wave of global transphobia. Casting a diverse array of genders, sizes, abilities, and races, and every single show and campaign, not just perfunctory pride capsule collections, which at this point are so homogenous and unimaginative, they feel positively homophobic. It looks like ending Men's Fashion Week and Women's Fashion Week, and instead just having Fashion Week. Moving beyond gender segregated stores and men's magazines and women's magazines, gender neutrality is not about forcing everyone to be non binary or erasing your right to be men or women, but rather it is about creating more expansive images of femininity, masculinity, and beauty for everyone. Fashion should proliferate possibility, not constrain it. Gender neutrality, most of all, is an anti violence imperative. The time has come for us to hold the fashion and beauty industries accountable for playing a significant role in creating regressive and violent gender stereotypes. The idea that there are different clothes and different products for men and women justifies and enables the vitriol and violence that gender non conforming people like me experience on the ground every single day. They say that we are failing to be men, that we're failing to, we, to be women, but really, we are just failing to be the Western gender stereotypes this industry has helped design. The truth is, we are not failing. In fact, we are succeeding on being ourselves. They call me a man in a dress, even though this body, it doesn't belong to a man, and this dress, it doesn't belong to a woman. Both of them belong to me. This industry determines who and what is worthy and reproduces this image all across the world. The justification is always marketability. This is just what people want to buy. But people want to buy what they have been shown is beautiful. So it's time to redefine beauty. I believe that fashion should be about the celebration of beauty, not the gender binary. I believe that the gender binary is an obstacle to beauty, one that holds its back from truly innovative design. Clothes are so much more than masculine or feminine. They are emotional, elegant, poetic. I know this firsthand. I got tired of being harassed in stores while shopping, and no brands be willing to dress someone like me, so I started to design my own clothes. I have created and modeled three gender neutral fashion collections over the past few years with my colleagues in India. I wanted to offer an example of what it looks like to create clothes for people, not just men or women. 
Non-binary design isn't just the future, it is our past and it is our present. With little to no institutional support or recognition, queer designers and creatives like myself have been moving beyond the binary, and now the time has come for this industry to take our lead. The question ahead is whether this industry will choose to partner with us or instead commit to remaining irrelevant. Excuse our beauty, our tremendous, tremendous beauty. Thanks so much. <laughs>